Let's pray. Lord, we just want to take a little time at the start of this prayer just to thank you for who you are. You are Alpha and Omega. You are all wise, all powerful, and ever present. We thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. We thank you for your wonderful son, Jesus, and for his sacrifice in our behalf. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who stands by our side and guides us into the way of life eternal. We thank you for angels who excel in strength, who have protected us from dangers we have seen as well as from dangers we'll know nothing about until we see your face in the New Jerusalem. We thank you for the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the roofs over our heads, the beds in which we sleep. We thank you for family, for friends, for neighbors, and for others who bless us and whom we can bless. We also thank you, dear Lord, for the potholes of life. Because if we didn't have the rough road to travel, some of us would not acknowledge that the eyes of all must wait upon you to provide our needs in due season. Lord, we plead for forgiveness of sins and for the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have said in your word that if your people will humble themselves, pray, seek your face, and turn from their wicked ways, you will forgive your people and heal their land. Today, we turn to you. We turn to you as a church, asking you to forgive us when we have loved with partiality, when we have taken your grace for granted, when we have thought about ourselves and not about the best interest of others. We intercede for our nation, for it is divided and in need of mending. Bless our leaders to recognize that righteousness exalts a nation, that when you call us to do justice, you call us to treat each soul with equity. Bless us to see as you see, to walk as you walk, to love as you love. We give you permission to occupy our hearts and recreate us each day so that we will look like you and when others see us, they will see a reflection of you and ask us, how can I have what you have? Finally, we ask you to turn our eyes upon Jesus so that we can look full in his wonderful face. May the things of this earth grow strangely dim, so much so until we are consumed with the thought of eternity with you. Please come and rescue us later, but more than that, please come and redeem us now. We pray these and other blessings, spiritual blessings, mental blessings, emotional blessings, social blessings, physical blessings, occupational blessings. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, saints of the living God. What a day it is and what an exciting time it is today to come together on this now second Sabbath of the new year. We are nine days in to January, which means we have nine days to give God thanks for this new year. This is an exciting time to be alive. We recognize that tough things have also happened this week. But Psalm 34 says that we should bless the Lord at what, everybody? At all times and continue to let his praises 
be in our mouths. Why should we be excited? The psalmist goes on to say, because we sought the Lord and he heard us and delivered us from all of our fears. And I want you to replace that word with anything that God has delivered you from. He's delivered you from addictions. He's delivered you from pessimism. He's delivered you from complaining. He may have even delivered you from some extra pounds already in this new year. God has been good to us. And we ought to rejoice and be glad in this day because he is good and worthy of all of our praise. Welcome to the Highland Avenue virtual experience. We pray that today would be a blessing to every single one of you in your homes or wherever you find yourself on this, our great God's day. And we just have a couple of announcements that we want to bring to your attention. Number one, we're getting ready to resume our midweek experiences. We'll be letting you know when those things will be taking off, but we want you to be aware that we are considering resuming and we're thinking about how we can do it better. So give us a little time as we get ready to roll those things out. In addition to that, we pray that you enjoyed the conference's convocation that went from January 1 all the way through January 5, as our area leaders here in our conference ministered through the power of the word each night, preparing us and getting our minds ready to take on 2021. In addition to that, the North American Division has 10 days of prayer that you can participate in even now. You can go to the North American Division website, even Google the words that I just said, uh, North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists. And when you do that, also short as the NAD, when you do that, you'll be able to find the 10 days of prayer schedule. You'll be able to find the devotionals for each day and participate in getting your mind and spiritual antenna tuned to the, the voice of God and the word of God this year as we prepare again to take on 2021 and all its tasks and challenges. Last but not least, um, we definitely want to say thank you. We being on behalf of my lovely bride, Miss Tanya May Bell, and I want to say thank you for blessing us the way that you did. We received your gift and we are so grateful for what you guys were willing to do to show your love and kindness toward us. It is more than we could have ever asked for and even thought of, but we're so grateful to even know you all and to be loved by you all, but also to show some love back. And I pray that not only um, were you able to experience it in giving, but you're also able to receive it from us in the different ways that we try and minister to every single one of you. May God bless you as we worship together this day. This is going to be an exciting time. I'm excited to preach the word of God, so I will see you soon. And let's prepare our hearts and minds for what God has to say to us today. In a world of uncertainty, we build our lives on promises. Parents promise to provide. Husbands and wives promise to be faithful. Businesses promise to pay. Financial institutions and markets offer the promise of growth and security and return on investment. What are the promises on which you build your life? Are you building your financial plan on the promises of the economy or on the promises of the kingdom? We're addicted to consumption, material excess, and spending beyond our means. The typical American family has $15,000 in credit card debt, $32,000 in educational debt, and $150,000 in mortgage debt. In fact, the total credit card debt for the country is $850 billion. The national debt of the United States has risen from $4 trillion in 2004 to over $17 trillion today, and the figure continues to grow by $2.7 billion per day. The numbers are staggering. According to independent experts, the total of federal unfunded liabilities the difference between what the government collects and what it has committed to pay is $127 trillion. That's over a million dollars per taxpayer and roughly double 2012's entire world economic output. This is not a partisan issue. It's simple arithmetic. Your securities may be less secure than you think. Your savings might not save you. And it's enough to make you ask, are you grounding your life on the boasts of the marketplace idols? or on the everlasting promises of a faithful God. 
The Bible says that the borrower is slave to the lender. Save money and compound interest is a miracle that works in your favor. Go into debt and compound interest is a nightmare that steals your future. Our money says in God we trust. What do your IOUs say? Is debt your servant or your master? Debt is not always unwise. There are many varieties of debt, and wise debt can increase your capacity for the kingdom. But unwise debt diminishes your capacity for generosity. Money you owe to the bank is money you cannot give to the needy. In fact, when you give to the needy, the Bible says God himself is indebted to you. The next time you face a debt decision, ask yourself, am I acting in faith or am I acting in fear? Am I taking something now that God might want to give to me in His time? Your promise to the bank is a liability. Your faithfulness to give to others is an asset on which they can build their lives. Financial freedom means the freedom to give, the freedom to live the life that is truly life, the freedom to join God in His mission of rescue and restoration. Are you building your life on your promises to pay the bank? Or are you building your life on God's promises to you? Which promise will you choose today? The star shall unfold, repairing his entrance. The star shall.
Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Would you turn with me to the book of Mark? Mark the 10th chapter. Mark the 10th chapter. We're going to look at the 46th through 52nd verse. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. I'm going to read from the NIV today. Feel free to follow along with me in whatever version that you have. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples Together with a large crowd were leaving the city a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind, so they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This afternoon, just for a brief time, I want to speak to you under the subject, it's worth shouting about. It's worth shouting about. During my grade school years at a predominantly white public school, we began class by pledging allegiance to the American flag and singing songs such as, this land is your land and this land is my land, from California to New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. Or we would sing something like, Oh beautiful, for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Of course, the national anthem was part of this morning ritual and it groomed us to believe in an America that was eclectic and inclusive of all genders races, nationalities, cultures, and creeds. As a young boy, it gave me hope that everyone counted and everyone mattered. Yet in 2021, I find myself discarding the traditional Eurocentric hymnody for the lyrics such as lift every voice and sing, till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day, 
begun, let us march on until victory is won. As I grew, I learned that this land is not my land unless it is a federally constructed ghetto. They mask with the nomenclature housing and urban development project. I learned that brotherhood does not always apply to black lives, but more so blue lives that belligerently badger a broken community and leverage their lives with the ends of barrels. I learned that equal treatment may not mean equal treatment for my people, but instead, the only equality that we'll ever find in this lifetime is found in God's benevolent bestowing of his grace to make it through another day on this seemingly God forsaken planet outside of his kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, what I discovered and learned is that life on this light, on this rock ain't fair. Life does not always go the way that we would like it to go. Yet, colloquially known as the Black National Anthem, James Weldon Johnson's words morphed during this milieu. No longer is it seemingly poetic prose that's skillfully penned for pleasurable recollection, but they are marching orders. Johnson said, no matter how bright the day, or dark the night, yea, even the past, we have an obligation to raise our voices and march until victory is won. That means that we do this knowing that we're going to strain our larynx and escalate our vibrato and remonstrate our comfort zones and even wear out our feet. We do this until we have victory or breakthrough. Well, can you imagine Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, and how he must have felt he's blind, segregated to the colony of the unclean, namely and ceremonially, and insurmountably overlooked as a beggar in Jericho. Scholars contest that Mark's very usage of his name, which is rare in the Gospels, calls on the community's knowledge of this citizen. They know who Bartimaeus is. They know who the son of Timaeus is. They recognize how unclean he is. They know that he's blind and a beggar. However, they're also known for perpetuating his condition through their contribution instead of transformative, relational, accountable means. So he sits and he begs. He begs and he sits. He sits and begs and begs and sits blindly. By definition, he is the least of these. Yet, during his time, it's the time of Passover. And while Jesus is steadfastly pursuing the path toward Jerusalem, where he will soon be unjustly tried and murdered, he hears shouting in the streets. There are crowds of people surrounding him. But someone is shouting his name louder and louder. And the question is, why? Bartimaeus, why didn't you have somebody call on him for you? Bartimaeus, why didn't you reach out to a friend to grab Jesus's attention? Why are you shot? Why does Bartimaeus feel the need to shout? I have three meager points and then I'm going to sit down. Ladies and gentlemen, stay with me for the next 20 minutes and I'm done. Here we go. Bartimaeus shouts because he knows Christ's ontology. <laughs> We're going to have some educational sermons this year. We're going to go deep into it. Christ, he knows Christ's ontology. Ontology is the metaphysics study or metaphysical study of being. In short, it is the study of being, how things exist, what they are like, the nature of one's being. 
when the crowd was passing through Jericho, <laughs> Bartimaeus audibly noticed them and asked them, what, what, what's going on? And their response was that Jesus the Nazarene was passing by. Did y'all catch that? Jesus the Nazarene was passing by. Look at verse 47. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Is he blind and? Jesus the Nazarene is passing by and Bartimaeus says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He was not calling on the Jesus that he heard about. He was not calling on the Jesus that others could relate to him by. He was not calling on the Jesus who had a reputation for being from Nazareth. He wasn't even calling on the Jesus that was Mary and Joseph's little boy. No, Bartimaeus was calling on Jesus for who he knew Christ to be. To Bartimaeus, Jesus was the son of David. Now, why is that significant? You see, the messianic alias was prophesied back in 2 Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles 17, Psalm 89, Isaiah 11, Jeremiah 23, and also 30, Ezekiel 34, Hosea 3 as well. It's all throughout prophecy that Jesus was going to be the son of David. He told David, there's going to be somebody who will perpetually sit on your throne. So Bartimaeus, now recognizing that Jesus is in the vicinity, he decides to call on the Jesus that he knows Jesus to be. So Bartimaeus calls on him knowing that that he is the Messiah, the one who was prophesied not only to rule or govern or be in charge or act presidential. Y'all talk to me today, but he was tasked with bringing healing and peace to the people of the land. He's not just Jesus, but he's the Messiah who's known as the son of David. When Bartimaeus is shouting his name, he is letting Jesus and everyone know who can hear him know that Bartimaeus knows who Jesus is. Those following Jesus described him by his elementary context. They knew him from where he grew up. You know, that same town that was questioned by the disciples, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Bartimaeus recognizes even in his unclean, blind, begging state that yes, something great did come out of Nazareth. And it's not simply that he's Jesus of Nazareth, but he is Jesus, the Messiah. He's no ordinary person from Palestine. He is the Prince of Peace. Real quick little warning before I move to point number two, be careful how you view your spirituality juxtaposed to another. For that person, though they seem less spiritual than you and less churchy than you, just might know more about God than you do and teach you more about God than you actually think you know. But there's a second reason that Bartimaeus is shouting. Bartimaeus shouted because he knows Christ's missiology. Missiology, it's the study of the church's mission, especially with respect to missionary activity. In short, Bartimaeus is shouting because he knows not only what Jesus can do, but what he's here to do. Mark, the 10th chapter, y'all think I'm making this up, verse 47 through 48. Watch what it says now. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, <laughs> son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him, verse 48, to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus is shouting to Jesus as the Messiah, recognizing that the Messiah's mission is to bring this kind of fulfillment to the lives of those around him. What kind of fulfillment are you looking for, EJ? Well, he's talking about having mercy on him. Bartimaeus understands that Jesus' mission 
is to those who are, guess what, everybody, downtrodden and hopeless. He sees Christ as the one who's capable of alleviating the pain that he is enduring. Bartimaeus sees Jesus as a merciful God. When everyone else around him thinks that he's been mercilessly abandoned and left to his begging blindness. As the matter of fact, he has been mercilessly abandoned and left to his begging blindness by his own fellow human. Yet Jesus considers him worthy of his attention. Surely Jesus would take note of not only everyone who's following him in the crowd, but even those who are stuck blind and begging by the wayside. As the matter of in fact, this is how Jesus started off his ministry. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim that this is the year of Jubilee or God's favor. Bartimaeus is calling on Jesus, not simply because he knows who he is, but because he knows what he does. The people don't understand why he is shouting. To them, it's a distraction and a disturbance. They do their best to shut him up. But the more they try, the louder he cries, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Hear me today, church. He refuses to let those attempting to suppress his vote, I mean voice, to stop him from being heard. His voice counts. His existence matters. His vote counts. His decision matters. The oppressed count. Their voice matters. Black lives count. Their pain and their process and their decision matters. Bartimaeus knows the value of his voice even when everybody else tries to suppress and devalue his voice. He knows that even if his vision is clouded and people are in the way, he used it to make known what he needed from God and for the the people to hear Jesus son of David have mercy on me now pay close attention because I don't want y'all to miss this see his response when Jesus calls him over and asks him what he wants Jesus did not limit his options if Jesus was a genie then Bartimaeus is Aladdin in this moment and anything that he wants it's on the table yet Bartimaeus's only request <laughs> Lord help me today Bartimaeus's only request is to see don't miss this y'all Bartimaeus is a blind beggar he blind and he broke but his one desire is to see if he can simply look <laughs> into the face of Jesus, the rest will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. He did not ask for money. He was not looking for 40 acres and a mule. He was not concerned with a new home or more food and new clothes or anything else. He simply wanted to see Jesus, and guess what, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pretty sure fresh out of this Christmas season that many of us did not have seeing Jesus on our Christmas list. Many of us had new toys and cars and watches and phones and all kinds of things that are external, but how many of us know the value that is found in simply being able to see Jesus amidst the situation and among the crowd? He was not 
missing money more than he was missing Jesus. He chose not to miss clothes more than he missed Jesus. He chose not to even relish in his predicament more than he could see Jesus. Bartimaeus didn't ask for a new president. He asked to see Jesus. He did not ask for new elected officials. He asked to see Jesus. He did not ask for Jesus to even take away the crowd of suppressors and oppressors. He asked to see Jesus in the crowd amidst the suppressors and oppressors. Hey, oh, say, saints of God, can you see Jesus moving in the middle of the crowd. Can you see Jesus in the middle of your circumstance? Have you asked Jesus for your eyes to be opened or are you st still too scared to look? Let's be clear, Jesus wasn't the only thing that Bartimaeus would see. He would see the faces of those who tried to suppress him and oppress him. But he would also see Jesus in the midst of them all. God's mercy was not demonstrated in removing the situation, but it was found in giving Bartimaeus sight to see God clearly in the midst of his predicament. Bartimaeus. <laughs> He was shouting, not just because he knew who Jesus was, but because he knew why Jesus was here. He knew what his mission was. He is merciful, compassionate, and a loving king who seeks the justice of his people. But there's just one more point, and then I'm going to step out the way and pray that you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath and take this with you into the kingdom. Bartimaeus, point number three, Bartimaeus shouted because he knows Christ's eschatology. Are we learning some, some language today? Some of you might want to pull out your dictionary. That's fine. Bartimaeus shouted because he knows Christ's eschatology. See, eschatology is the part of theology that's concerned with the death, judgment, and the final destiny of a soul and of humankind. So in short, Eschatology is all about last days. It's all about how will this thing wrap up? What's the end going to be? See, Bartimaeus shouted because he knew Christ's eschatology. Pay attention, it's the narrative. When Jesus and the crowd were coming by, Bartimaeus began to shout. Jesus and the crowd are still moving. And the people are trying to shut him up. However, Bartimaeus shouted even more because he knew that Christ's arrival was coming sooner than he thought. He knew that Jesus was passing by. And he recognized that in order to make sure that Jesus can hear me, I have to make sure I grab his attention with the best means that I have. There's no excuse for me not to say his name out loud now. Because if I can't say his name now, then I definitely won't be saying it later. If I can't yell out Jesus now while he's passing by and while he's on the way, then surely I can't yell Jesus later. If I'm afraid to talk about him now, then I should be afraid to talk about him later. But if I can get down in my soul that he is worth shouting about and that this gospel is worth proclaiming and that this message is worth heralding, then it, he will not be ashamed of me because I am not ashamed of him. And even though I am unclean and cast to the side and uncared about by my fellow human being, and even though they're tired of me yelling 
yelling and trying to shut me up and trying to stop my march and trying to stop my protest, I recognize that I still have a responsibility to prepare for the end of time. Watch this now. The last time somebody shouted for Jesus around Jericho, the walls came down. And this time all of heaven came down in the form of Jesus Christ to eradicate the oppression that Yeshua, I mean Jesus, I mean Joshua, I mean Jesus, oh yeah, they're spelled the same way, were protesting against. Jesus had commanded and commenced and is resuming the instantaneous march and protest with a shout. Jesus had commanded Joshua and the Israelites to shout until the walls came down. He told John, you ought to cry out and shout in the wilderness until the people come out of their sins. Jesus shouted until he had nothing left. And Jesus will shout when he is on his way back. And so many of you are wondering, Pastor Bell, why are you so loud? Why are you proclaiming this thing? Why do you care about black lives? Why do you care about social justice? Why are you pushing this gospel. Why can't you preach softly? And here is why I preach so loud. Here is why I lift my voice. Here is why I proclaim this thing with vigor and tenacity. Because there was a time when my ancestors had to go out in the forest and sneak out of their slave cabins into the dark of night. And there they would put up white sheets. And they were called white sheet churches. And there they didn't have a preacher. They didn't have a choir. They didn't even have a praise team or any formal liturgy, but they just began to moan through their pain and they moaned for their children and they moaned for the whips and lashes that came across their back and they moaned for the travail that had happened to their mothers and to their fathers and how their men were defeated. They moaned for them and now I shout because they couldn't shout. I shout because they didn't have the opportunity. I yell because I have a right to praise God in the loudest and best way that I can. Why do I shout? I shout because there are SNCC students who sat silently in protest and could not raise their voices as they were unserved and had the police and dogs called on them. No, I shout for them. I raise my voice for them because they deserve justice. They deserve a voice and they deserve to be heard hundreds of years and tens of years later. Ladies and gentlemen, I shout because I'm worth more than peanut butter and cotton gins. I shout because Emmett was hung on a tree and Martin was sniped on a balcony and George was murdered outside the store and Medgar was laid out in his driveway and Brianna and both of them were both killed in their living room. I shout because this gospel is worth shouting about. And so why do we shout? We shout because Jesus shouted. We shout because John shouted. We shout because the three angels shouted. We shout because we want our voices to be heard. We shout until the walls come down. We shout until victory is won. We shout until women are respected. We shout until black lives matter because until black lives matter, then all lives can't matter. We shout because we have something worth shouting about. That is why we shout. And my appeal to you today is real simple. Either you're going to shout it or you're going to shut it. We ain't got time for no more. I'm going to sit at home on the gospel. We ain't got time for that. We need some folks who are gonna get out here and proclaim what thus saith the Lord and let people know that he's coming again. We have this hope. Now let's not let it get stuck burning in our hearts. But like Jeremiah, may it burn so much within you that it's like fire shut up in your bones and you can't help but tell somebody about it. If that's you, I want you to type it into the YouTube chat on your app. If that's you, you can email us at decision at havechurch.com. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to make a decision for Jesus today. Prayer, baptism, Bible study, 
even if it's just to be more involved, you can let us know in the chat, Facebook, Instagram, church website, so many different ways. We want to pray for you that God would bless you with your decision. And so today, let's pray. Father, we heard you. We have something worth shouting about. And so today, may our voices be heard. May we lift every voice and sing and march and fight and battle and work until the victory is won. God, this gospel isn't just meant to be a country club calling card. Show our badge we're Christians and everybody accepts us. No, God, you've given us this gospel and you've told your disciples, listen, take it to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, God, wherever we find ourselves today, whether it's here in Southwest Michigan, whether it be in a different country, God, even if it be virtually, God, we pray that we would take this gospel and share it, not just on Facebook, but that we would connect with people and that we would be people who, unlike Bartimaeus's fellow citizens, don't simply contribute to the perpetuation of people's plight. But God, I pray that you'd give us the power to pull them out of their plight and place them on solid ground. You are that ground. You are that provision. You are the foundation of what people need to stand on. You are the reason we march, the reason we fight, the reason we lift our voices, because we love you and because we love you, we love our fellow brothers and sisters and we fight for them. And so today we make that decision. God bless those who are selecting baptism or Bible study or maybe they just need special prayer. God, I'm praying that they'd reach out to us in the best way that they can, all the options that we've put out there so that they too would not only experience what Bartimaeus experienced, seeing you afresh and anew, but that like Bartimaeus, they would follow you wherever you go. Father, bless the rest of our day. May this be the beginning of a new journey with you and not one where we simply chalk it up to another Sabbath service. We want to be different. We want to be transformed. And we see the need for it, especially here at the beginning of 2021. So keep us. Until we can see you, may we serve you, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Saints of God, don't let this message go to waste. It's not because I've preached it, but because God is calling you to act. There was a president, his name was John F. Kennedy. He said the following words, don't, don't ask, what can your country do for you? Ask what you can do for your country. Well, I'm asking you in a different form, not asking what can Christ do for you, but what can you do for Christ and his kingdom? Make that decision to act today. And I promise you, your life will never be the same. We thank you so much for joining us here in our virtual worship experience. <clears throat> we pray that you were blessed, and we pray that God will continue to keep you until we can virtually meet again. God bless you.